Okay, welcome to note set 29. And uh, with this note set, I think this is the end of chapter 6. There may be a few sections in chapter 6 that we didn't cover. I can't remember off the top of my head. <coughs> but uh, I'm pretty sure this is the last section we'll be covering in chapter 6. Um, so you see the word value. You see the word decomposition, and you're expecting to see eigen. Um, but we see something else called singular. Um, so this is something related to eigenvalue decomposition, as we'll see. Um, and in fact, it's a little generalization of the eigenvalue decomposition. So if I've been telling you eigenvalue decomposition is extremely important, well, this is too. Um, so anything that is related to these ideas <clears throat> pops up all the time. So let's motivate what we're trying to do here. Um, so we've already seen uh, that one of the key ideas, kind of the idea behind eigenvalues and eigenvectors, is that we're trying to diagonalize the matrix. And that really breaks it apart and allows us to see its structure. And in another sense, it allows us to think about taking um, some scenario that we're working in that is characterized by matrix A, where things are not aligned with, with axes, and transforming into a new space where all the important action is aligned with axes. And so that makes things very easy to work with. Um, and then we can do our work in that new domain and then transform back to the old domain after we've done our work. Um, so I know that sounds a little ambiguous, um, but that's, that's the basic idea of what's going on with this. Um, but there's three main limitations that we've had when we're dealing with the Eigen decomposition. The first one is that when we look at this equation, AX, so we're operating on X, and we end up getting just a scalar multiple of x. That means that a must be square. So the concept of eigenvalue, eigenvector, is only defined for square matrices. The other thing that we've seen is that the eigenvectors are usually not orthogonal. And we had to take special, special care to, to address that. Um, we could only do it in certain cases. Um, and in particular, we looked at symmetric um, matrices, and that allowed us to do that. But we don't always have a symmetric matrix. Um, and the other thing is that there's not always enough eigenvectors to um, handle the, uh, you know, all the, the, the space that the matrix is dealing with. Um, and that leads to some problems uh, as, as well and some difficulties. Um, so the, the big thing is that eigen decompositions are limited to square matrices. So you give me a rectangular matrix and I can't diagonalize it. First of all, what does it really mean to diagonalize a, a rectangular matrix? It's not really clear. Um, since a diagonal matrix has to be square to be a true diagonal matrix. Um, but we certainly can't do something related to that. Basically boil it down to um, a matrix that has just non-zero elements down kind of its main diagonal, even if it doesn't go from corner to corner. And even if A is square, um, so we, we have a square matrix, but it's not symmetric. Uh, or it has some structure that doesn't provide enough eigenvectors. We would love to be able to get for a square matrix, but not symmetric, some sort of decomposition that would still have the nice properties of orthogonality. But we can't do that with the eigen decomposition. So again, we're asking questions. We're seeing things, and we're trying to push the limit. 
hmm, I'd like to be able to do this. I can do it for this small category. Can I expand that idea? Not just have it work exactly the same, but something's going to have to give um, in order to make their, uh, an alternative available to us. If we didn't have to change anything, then we could do it with eigenvalues and vectors. Um, and we would have already figured that out. So this idea of singular vectors um, and their corresponding singular values and the corresponding singular value decomposition um, solves all these problems. And it solves it in a very beautiful, perfect way. Um, but the price we have to pay when we had eigenvectors up here, there was just one set of them. Now we're going to have two sets of singular vectors. We'll still have just one set of singular values, but there's going to be so-called left singular value, uh, sorry, left singular vectors and right singular vectors. Um, and uh, they'll be different in general. But that's the price that we'll have to pay for this more general ability. So let's define what we mean by singular values and vectors. So we're going to let A be some M by N matrix. Could be square, but we're mostly interested in the rectangular part. But again, um, we could be looking at a square matrix that's not symmetric. And so uh, we would like to be able to um, do this, do a decomposition with orthonormal um, vectors. Um, and we're going to define, not define, but just state that this matrix has rank R. Um, and it need not be full rank. So that means whichever of these is the smallest, um, that's the largest that the rank could be. And R may be smaller yet. So let's generalize this idea. Um, we had a, a condition for the eigenvalue eigenvector. Um, and if you remember there, we had A was square, we had an eigenvector, then we had a lambda K, and we ended up with the same vector. So, I mean, we did it with X. We had a lambda, and we had an X. So what are we doing now? We're doing A operates on some vector V, and what does it give us? Let me clear this off here if I can. Come on, work for me here. There we go. I'm mapping VK with the matrix A, and what do I get? A scalar multiple, not of VK, but some other vector, UK. So there's the two sets. We've got the VK for K equal 1 to R. We've got a whole other set, the UK from 1 to R. And we've got the singular values from 1 to R. And notice that we only need as many as there are to get out to the rank of the matrix. Um, so that's, that's interesting. We also see that these, have, these vectors have different dimensions. Uh, has to work this way. Since A is M by N, this has to be n by 1 to be multiplied from the left by a. And then the result has to be m by 1. And remember, this is a scalar out in front. So we now have two types of singular vectors. Um, we've got the vk's and the uk's. We've got as many, the same number as each of them, uh, for each of them. And uh, we've got as many of each of them as there is rank of the matrix. And it's pretty easy to see that UK, each UK is in the column space of A. It has to be since it's being built this way. Um, a little harder to see, but if you go back and you look at um, when we talked about solving the um, solving an equation, ax equal to b, we said that uh, we could think of x as being in the row space of a. Um, and so the vk's will be in the row space of a. And then this is a, a remarkable part. The, the sigma k's 
We call those the singular values. There will be as many of them as there are each of the types of singular vectors, but they're all positive numbers. That's interesting. Remember, we had to work hard to get eigenvalues to be um, positive. We had to say, well, first it's symmetric, then it's the special thing, positive, definite. Well, now they're all positive numbers. We're, we're imposing that. This is what we want. We haven't said anything yet at all about whether we can get this, how we're going to get this. We're just saying we're looking for this. We're, we're wishing, we're hoping. Turns out that we can get this, but this is kind of how new ideas are developed. We say, hmm, wonder, could I get this? This is something I would like. Let me explore to see how I can get this. So here's the first step towards seeing this diagonalization. So we, we have this, this wish that we're expanding this idea of eigenvectors. Uh, we have not yet seen that it leads to diagonalization in a more general way, but we're going to take a couple steps towards that and end up seeing that indeed it does. So given this structure, I'm just repeating what we just saw, we can rewrite this in the following form. Um, so we can just take all the VKs and stack them as columns in some matrix. And since there's R of them, we'll call this V sub R. There's a reason that we're putting a subscript there and not just calling it V, capital V. Um, we'll, we'll extend this later. So A is M by N. This matrix is N by R. We know that these two have to match, so they do. Um, so the result of that will be M by R. And then <clears throat> over on the right side, we've got uh, a scalar that has to show up in front of each vector. So if we stack all of our U vectors from 1 out to R as columns, and we call this matrix U sub R, and we multiply from the right by this diagonal matrix with the singular values down the diagonal, <coughs> excuse me, um, remember those are all positive numbers, um, and there's as many of them as the value of the rank of the matrix, A. Uh, so this is square, so it's going to be R by R, we'll call that sigma sub R. So remember, just like for eigenvalues, we had lambda values, lambda 1, lambda 2, so on, and we put them into a diagonal matrix called capital lambda. So here we have little sigma 1, little sigma 2, and we put them in an uppercase sigma, and here we're going to put a subscript R, and we'll, we'll, we're going to remove that subscript in just a little bit, and you'll see why we do that. Um, but you should be able to verify that a diagonal matrix like this times this just ends up matching up column by column. So A times V1 will be sigma 1 times U1. A times V2 will be the second column, and that will match up with U2 times sigma, sigma 2, and so on and so on. So we can see that we are on the path to diagonalization because we've got this diagonal matrix here. Right? This thing is diagonal. But what we don't have is that, that nice structure where we can say A is equal to um, some matrix times a diagonal matrix times another matrix. Um, or that we can multiply A from left and right by appropriate matrices and end up with a completely diagonal matrix. So to do that, um, either of those things, we need this one to be invertible to be able to swing that over to here. We need uh, to, to end up having something times A times something gives us a diagonal matrix. And we need this one to be invertible to swing over to here so that we can get A is equal to something times a diagonal matrix times something. That's, that's kind of the decomposition version of it. But can we invert these things? Well, not in the way that we are normally used to thinking about it, right? This is an N by R matrix. This is an M by R matrix. So they are not square. 
And when we're usually talking about invertible matrices, we're talking about square matrices. So that's a little stumbling block here that we have to overcome. So we've not yet shown this. Um, so we're just wishful thinking right now, but uh, we'll be able to show that this is true. Um, so a fact that we'll end up being able to show is that these vectors that we have so far um, will be orthogonal. So if we can find vectors that satisfy that singular value equation that we started off with, we'll be able to find them to be orthogonal. Um, and you know, obviously these are in different spaces because they're different sizes. So these will be orthogonal um, to, e to each other and these will be orthogonal to each other. But we can't really say anything about um, how they relate to each other because they're in different spaces, they're different um, dimensions. And this all links into our wonderful four spaces um, that's kind of the centerpiece of all of linear algebra and is driven home in um, this book. That's one of the reasons that I, I absolutely love this book. So we've got our, our matrix, M by N matrix A, uh, and what we'll see is that these V sub K live in the row space. We already said that. Uh, the V's are in the row space. And we've already said that the U's are in the column space. Um, and so notice what we've got. We've got R orthonormal. So, I mean, they're orthogonal, but we can always normalize these things. We've got R orthonormal vectors in a space that has dimension of R. So this is actually a basis of that row space. And likewise, over here we've got a subspace. This column space is dimension R. And we've got R orthogonal or orthonormal, even better, orthonormal vectors in that space. So that is a basis of that subspace. So we've got an orthonormal basis of the row space. We've got an orthonormal basis of the column space. What's left? Well, you know, remember the whole space over here is Rn, and the whole space over here is Rm. The rest of this, so this is dimension R, the rest of the dimensions are made up by the null space. The rest of the dimensions here are made up by the left null space. Um, so that's, they're going to come into play in just, in just a minute. So here is our second step towards seeing and, or getting to the diagonalization of this. So we have these orthonormal bases of the row and column spaces. Let's expand it, right? We've got uh, some remaining part of Rn over here. We've got some remaining part of Rm. Well, we know that, um, let me clear this off a bit here. We know that this null space is orthogonal to the, row, to the row space. We know that the left null space is orthogonal to the column space. So if we can just pick some vectors down here that are orthogonal to each other um, and, and are an orthonormal basis of this space, then together with those, there'll be an orthonormal basis of the whole thing. Same thing over here. We can just pick some orthonormal basis for this, and to, since they will be orthogonal to all of these, just by nature, um, taking the whole will give an orthonormal basis for Rm. And that's exactly what we're going to do. So we're going to extend. We're going to just wish into existence. We're going to pick. Um, we know they exist, so we're just saying we'll pick some. Pick Vk where k runs from r plus 1 out to n. Notice that there's just enough here to cover this null space because its dimension is n minus r. And then we're going to pick from r plus 1 out to m some orthogonal vectors that will, oh, I went the wrong way, that will go uh, over that space. So we just pick them. Now we've got an orthonormal basis for here, an orthonormal basis for this subspace, but they're also orthonormal to each other. So together, 
the, the, all of the V's form an orthonormal basis for Rn. And likewise, over on the other side, we've got an orthonormal basis for the column space, and we've got a, a selected orthonormal basis for the left null space. They are orthonormal to each other, therefore we have an entire orthonormal basis for Rm. Now, these down here are are kind of arbitrary how we pick them. I mean, they have to be orthonormal basis for the null space and the left null space, but they don't have to s really satisfy much. Um, they're, they're not as constrained. But the, the V1 through R and the U1 through R, those have to be carefully picked so that they satisfy that singular value equation. A times VK is equal to some number sigma K times UK. So we have to pick those very, very carefully. But once we have them, just tack on any old orthonormal vectors down here, and we're good to go. Now we've got an orthonormal basis for the whole space. Now, so what? What does that allow us to do? Well, let's look at what we had written already with a star next to it. I've rewritten it here. So we've got our M by N matrix A, we've got our N by R matrix VR, we've got our M by R matrix U sub R, and we've got an R by R matrix sigma sub R. So that's where we're starting, and what we're going to do is extend this using this now full orthonormal basis. So what we're going to do is stick in here all those extra V's, and that'll extend this out to an N by N matrix. And then we're going to stick in here all those extra U's that span the left null space. And that will extend this to an M by M matrix. And we're going to have to extend this down some. Uh, so we'll have to put some stuff over here and some stuff over here. And we'll need to make sure that everything works out just right. So what do we got here? We've got M by N times n by n now. So this whole thing will be m by n. This will be m by m. And this will have to be what? It will have to be m and it will have to be by n so that we match everything up just right. So if we do this, let's extend this out. And we see that we've still got our a. We haven't done anything to that. We've tacked on our additional vectors to make a full orthonormal basis for Rn. And so now we get an n by n matrix. Notice that I've dropped the R subscript there. Down here, I've tacked on some additional vectors. So now I have an M by M matrix down there instead of an M by R matrix. And I've dropped the subscript down here. Come on, there we go. And then look very carefully at this last matrix over on the right. It's a little deceptive. Um, so what I'm going to do is this was originally a square matrix here. This was R by R. And I ultimately need to end up with an M by N matrix there. So what I'm going to do here um, is tack on some zeros here, and this will not be square. So it's going to be m minus r and n minus r by n minus r. And that means that this won't be square either, and this won't be square. Okay? So what that really means is this looks like this diagonal continues down and goes to the, the corner here, but it, it won't really. Depending on the relationship between m and n, uh, there may actually if I draw the diagonal down, there may be more rows down here. Or if I draw the diagonal down, that could be the last row there, and there could be more columns over here. We'll look at this in a little bit more detail when we do some examples. But we're basically extending this. And what's the point of doing this? Well, remember we asked, could we invert the V sub R matrix or the U sub R matrix? 
And we couldn't really because they were rectangular. But what do we got now? We've got n by n, v, and we've got m by m, u. Oh, we're sitting pretty. Because not only are these square, but the columns are orthonormal vectors. These are invertible. In fact, they're easily invertible because they're orthonormal vectors in the columns, so their transpose will be equal to their inverse. So we've jumped. Remember when we did the eigenvalue, we started off with the s and the s inverse, and then we ultimately got to the q and the q transpose only when we constrained ourselves to symmetric matrices? Well, we've just jumped past all that crap. We've, we've already gotten to the point, without putting any constraints on the matrix, we've already gotten to the point where we've got these orthogonal matrices here. So not only are we diagonalizing a rectangular matrix, any old rectangular matrix, but damn, we're getting orthogonal matrices here, just like that, for free. Well, we haven't really proved this yet. This is all still wishful thinking. These things were easy to get. We could get any old vectors out here and any old vectors out here that were in the appropriate null spaces. But these things, remember, we need to pick those so that they satisfy that singular value and singular vector equation that we wished into existence. So we're not there yet, but we'll soon see it. But we're on the road towards this. So if we can show that we can get orthogonal vectors that satisfy those that singular value, singular vector equation, then we're done. And we've got a beautiful, powerful result on our hands. So let's look at this. So again, we're still wishing this into existence. We haven't proven that we can do this. But would I go through all this if we couldn't? No, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. Let's look at this. So now we have, if we just write this more compactly, <laughs> let me clear off all my chicken scratchings here. We've got A times V is equal to U times sigma. We've dropped all the subscript R's. So there's what we got. A is M by N. V is N by N, orthogonal <laughs> matrix. U is M by M, yes, orthogonal matrix. Sigma is m by n. So because the v and u are orthogonal matrices, they are invertible and easily invertible. Just transpose them and you got it. So if we start from this equation, which again, we haven't proved it, but we're wishing it and it's going to come true. If we start from there, we take u we multiply from each side by u transpose. These will cancel or turn into the identity matrix and leave sigma, only sigma, on the right side. And so this is the diagonalization. So that's why I say singular value decomposition view of the diagonalization. So u transpose is m by m, a is m by n, v is n by n, everything works beautifully. We end up with an M by N matrix where there's a square diagonal matrix in the upper left hand corner. And then we have to fill in these zero, all zero matrices to flesh this out to be the appropriate M by N size. So we're going to put some number of rows here, some number of columns here, and that will then lead to the appropriate size of that. So we'll look more at the structure of this in just a little bit. So that's the diagonalization view. Let's look at the decomposition view. So we start back here, going back one slide, clear this off. We start with this view, and now what we want to do is decomposition. So now we're going to multiply from the right by V transpose, which is its inverse these things convert into the identity matrix, so they're gone. And we're left with this, U sigma V transpose. So there it is. A is equal to U sigma V transpose. And you can see all the dimensions that I got there. A is M by N, 
u is m by m, sigma still m by n, v transpose n by n, and we have this same structure here where we tack on some zeros at the bottom, we tack on some zeros over here, and we tack on some zeros over here. And again, we'll, we'll see the structure of all this stuff that rings that. Now, I am commenting here that we often put these, in fact, we almost always do it, we put the singular values in descending order. So that sigma 1 is the largest of them. Remember, they're all, they're all positive numbers. Um, we put the largest one first. That will mean that the, the, the columns in U and V will correspond to that. The first column in U and the first column in V will correspond to that sigma 1, and so on, and so on, and so on. So if we do this multiplication out, let me clear this off just a little bit here. So if we do this multiplication out, we get exactly the same result that we would get if we were to put u sub r, sigma sub r, and v sub r here. Um, and that's because of how we've cleverly included the zero structure here. It eliminates the, the effect of the last the columns that were added to u and v that came from the null space. We didn't really need those. We tacked those on there just as a convenience so that we could get these square matrices and think about things in terms of inverses. It just makes things a little easier to talk about, but actually it wasn't really crucial. We could have, we could have found an other way around it without actually even introducing those. Because look, when we do this multiplication, these are the terms that we're left with. None of those null space vectors even come into play. Now, technically, we can think about those null space vectors, the ur plus 1 and vr plus 1 and r plus 2 and r plus 3 all the way out, however far we want to go. We can think of those as being out here, but with zeros in front of them. Where do those zeros come from? They are the continuation down the diagonal that is in that right-hand corner. Now, that's not square, so when we continue the diagonal down, we don't go all the way down to this corner, necessarily. We might end up hitting up here or hitting down here. When we do some examples, we'll see that. So we can and often do rewrite this in its compact version. Since we don't really need all those, um, the, the rightmost columns of U and the rightmost columns of V, um, we can just write it like this. And so this um, is working with those sub R matrices. And notice that we can think of that acting like an inverse of that V um, sub R. Um, and it, it does almost, it works like a, a right inverse to, to V. Um, and so this is very, very interesting. So let's just fall back and regroup and just take a look here. This is uh, a lot of stuff on this slide here. So um, the matrices V and U, where's my thing? There we go. I always lose track of where it is. There it is. Matrices V and U contain orthonormal bases for the RM and RN, um, but also for all the four subspaces, since those make up RM and RN. So if we look at the first R columns of V, those are the important columns of V, they were the singular vectors, uh, the, the, the V singular vectors of A, and they span the row space. They're a basis of the row space. And if we look at the last n minus r columns of V, those are the ones that we tacked on specifically to be a basis for the null space. Then if we go over to U, the first r, notice it's the same number of columns. The first r columns of U, those are the important ones. Those are the ones that the, are the actual singular vectors called U vectors. They are an orthonormal basis for the column space of A. And then the last M minus R columns of U are an orthonormal basis for 
the null space of A transpose or the, the, the left null space. And so we, we are just showing this picture down here that we've seen already, um, showing where each of these things is. So this is just a one-stop picture to kind of see the, the space structure of all of this. Now, for the eigenvalue stuff, we went through some hand calculations. And to be honest, doing hand calculations of eigenvalues is really not something that we do. Um, you do it to kind of learn and kind of see how it all works. But um, when we do real engineering, we're, we're computing eigenvalue decompositions. And there was an eigenvalue decomposition MATLAB command, just EIG, which we, we talked about. Um, but there's also one called SVD, um, Singular Value Decomposition. And so here's MATLAB's help on that. So it says we've got some matrix X. Um, doesn't necessarily have to be rectangular or uh, square. Um, and it's going to compute these three matrices. So U and V are exactly what we called um, U and V before. Um, S is what we were calling the sigma matrix. Kind of hard to do a sigma in MATLAB. Um, so it produces a diagonal matrix S of the same dimension as X. Um, and we'll, we'll see um, what we mean by that um, in some examples. And notice here we say non-negative diagonal elements. I thought we were saying that um, the singular values were all positive. Well, remember what we're now talking about is this. So this is our decomposition that we're finding. Let me clear this ink off here. So we're finding this matrix U and this matrix V without the transpose. And we're finding this whole matrix here. And so what we're saying is that it's diagonal with these non, well, these positive numbers down the first part of the diagonal, and then we hit a bunch of zeros going down. Um, and, and the reality is, is that if uh, whichever is the smallest, m or n, will have that number minus r many zeros that we'll hit as we go down the diagonals. And we can think of those as zero singular values. So we've extended this idea. So we've got the non-zero or the positive singular values up here, and then we hit a bunch of non, or I'm sorry, a bunch of zero singular values down here that are in our, our sigma matrix. So we'll, we'll see that as we go through the examples. Um, MATLAB says that the matrices U and V are unitary matrices. That's a generalization of the idea of an orthogonal matrix, covering the case where all of these could be complex valued, except for S. S will always be real um, with non-negative elements in it. Um, there is a version of the SVD. If you don't want the vectors and you just want the singular values, you can just do SVD of X um, and assign it to a single variable. Um, and that'll put, instead of up here where this is a matrix, S down here becomes a vector containing the singular values. Oh, and I didn't mention, but the, the elements down the diagonal of S are in decreasing order. Same thing here. The elements in the vector S, as we go from uh, left to right, I, I think it, uh, well, actually, I think it will create a column vector. So it'll be from top to bottom. will be in um, descending order. So that's kind of nice. And then there's this alternate version. We put in uh, SVD of X, so just like this, our output structure is the same, but our input structure has a second argument, uh, which is the, the number zero. And this produces an economy size version of this. It's kind of like um, using the, the sub R matrices, although it's slightly different. Um, and then there's another way to call that, or at least something similar, where instead of putting in the zero, we put in, uh, in single quotes, the, the um, s truncated word economy, just econ. Um, and you can look at this and compare what it's saying 
Uh, so what these things will give you will depend upon whether um, the matrix X is square or um, rectangular that's tall or rectangular that's short. So the best thing to do is just you know, create a square matrix, try each of these and see what happens. Create a tall matrix, try each of these and see what happens. Create a short matrix, try each of these and see what happens. So here's some MATLAB examples. We're going to use the full version, not the economy version. Uh, so if you want to see how the economy, the two flavors of economy, with the zero and with the, the text econ, uh, try out these examples on that and compare and contrast and see if you can puzzle it out. But here we've got a square matrix, and I've created one that's full rank. So if you uh, look at this matrix, you should be able to verify at least visually have a feeling that it looks like it's full rank. Um, and then um, you could run the rank command on it to verify. So if you input A here, which I don't show the command for inputting A, I just show the result of having input it. If you then run rank A, it should say rank is equal to 3. And then we do the SVD. So here's our, our U matrix which is orthogonal. Here's our V matrix, which is orthogonal. And the interesting part of this, I mean, we can't really easily see that those are actually orthonormal columns, but let's look at the S matrix. So for the square case, all three of these matrices all have the same dimension as the regular A. We can see that. We saw that um, in, in our general results. Um, and so now, uh, but look at this S matrix. So since it's going to be 3 by 3 and it's diagonal, the diagonal runs from corner to corner. So we've got zeros up here, we've got zeros down here, um, and also we see that this is in descending order. And we see that there are three non-zero positive um, singular values. So those are the singular values. I've highlighted them blue. MATLAB doesn't do that. And I've put a little red dash box around them. MATLAB does not do that either. Um, but we see that the number of singular values that are not zero is equal to the rank. And that's exactly what we've seen. Remember we said when we started off our sigma sub r had positive, not zero, positive singular values, and there were r of them. That will always be true. So if you compute the singular values, look to see how many of them are non-zero. That'll tell you the rank of the matrix. We can also see kind of how close it is to being full rank. So if this number here, if this last singular value, if these stayed the same, and this thing was really small, like maybe 0 0.0001 relative to the other two, we would be seeing this matrix is really close to being not full rank. So that's a cool insight that the singular values give us. Oh, you know what? I missed something. I should go back. Um, yeah, I didn't comment about this. Like we saw with the eigenvalue decomposition, these things form rank one matrices. Um, and so what we're doing is we're adding up R rank one matrices to create a rank R matrix. And remember, the sigmas are all positive out to sigma R. So these terms will all contribute. But remember that we also put these in descending order. So sigma 1 is the largest. So this will be the most significant contribution to building A. It's the biggest part. And if the last singular value is really small compared to all the other ones, this has hardly any bearing. It's almost not there. If this slips to 0, it's gone. So that's why we say if the, if the smallest eigenvalue, or I'm sorry, singular value is close to zero, we're close to having a non-full rank matrix. Um, and we're seeing, well, we didn't see that here. We saw a case where it's very clearly full rank. 
All right, so I had to go back and catch that. Let's look at a square matrix, but deficient rank. So what did I do? I took the original A, and notice that I just, I replaced its third column with this, which happens to be the same as the first column. Just a cheap and dirty way to make a deficient uh, rank matrix. So the first two columns are still independent, so I know that I have rank two. And you can plug this into MATLAB and check it and do the rank command, and it'll tell you rank two. Now I do the singular value decomposition of this, and I still get um, three by three, three by three, three by three, but look, I get zero here. Now these changed a little bit. They're going to change, um, but they're still fairly significant, but I've got a zero there. So now I can see that if I compute the singular value decomposition, if I see any of the singular values that are zero, I know that my matrix is rank deficient. Um, and so that's kind of the key here. Um, and notice that uh, for a square matrix, whether it's rank deficient or not, we still get um, all three matrices are the same size as the original matrix, which is three by three. And all we need to do is go down the diagonal from corner to corner. All right, that's for the square case. So up here I'm telling you to observe the matrix sizes and observe the number of sigma values that are greater than zero. So those are the kind of important things that we're looking at. Um, and this number of sigma that are greater than zero will tell you what the rank of the matrix is. All right, let's look at a tall rank, or a, a tall matrix. Uh, so this one is five by three, and I made it to be full rank. If you were to input this matrix into MATLAB, run the um, rank command, it would tell you that it's three. Remember that the largest the rank can be is the smallest of the number of rows or columns. So um, the smallest of rows and columns is three here. So this has rank three, uh, telling us that it's full rank. Now here's where the interesting stuff starts. Remember, um, the, um, the U and the V are going to be different sizes now. Um, so this is, U is going to be M by M. So M is 5, so this is 5 by 5. Uh, so these are um, 5 orthonormal columns that will span R5 and be an orthonormal basis of R5. Uh, v is going to be n by n. n is 3 in this case. So we have three columns that are orthonormal, and those three columns will be a basis for R3. Um, and uh, remember the first three columns of this, because the rank is equal to 3, will span um, the column space of um, A. And the first three columns of this will span the row space uh, of, of A. And let's look at that S matrix. So it's full rank, so we still get three, uh, and it's rank three, so we still get three non-zero singular values. But look at the structure. It's no longer diagonal. So go back and look at the square. It went, let me clear this stuff off here. If we look at this, it's three by three, and so that diagonal runs from corner to corner. Let's look at this now. This is now same size as the original A. That's always true. S is always the same size as the original A, unless you do the economy version of this. Um, and so now the diagonal, you just start going um, down one over one, down one over one, and boom! You run out at that point. So this hits along the vertical. So there are um, some extra rows at the bottom that convert this into a um, tall rectangular matrix. But these, just going down the diagonal as far as you can, those are the singular values. And we can see that they are all positive. Full rank, rank three. 3 by 5, uh, 5 by 3, rather. All right, let's now look at a deficient rank case. And I, I just played the same trick here. Um, 
I, I took this third column, removed it, and substituted the first column in. So now I have a deficient rank, meaning not full rank. Rank is equal to two in this case. All the sizes of my vector or of my matrices are the same: five by five, three by three, and five by three. But look, I still get going down the diagonal. I go down one. I go down one over one, down one over one, and boom! I'm out of room. Those are the singular values. Two of them are non-zero. One of them is zero. So these are the sigma 1 through sigma r. This is the one additional signal val sig sing singular value that um, we include to show that one of the singular values is zero. Rank deficient. So that's interesting. Now let's look at a short matrix. So this one is full rank. So it's three rows, five columns. You can verify with the rank command that it has rank three. The largest the rank can be with three rows and five columns is three. We do our SVD computation. MATLAB spills it back to us. Now U is three by three. That's M by M. V is N by N, which is five by five. So now, um, Remember, rank here is full, so R is equal to 3. So I take the first three columns of this. Those will span the row space of A. We take the first three columns of this. They will span the um, column space of A. Um, these will span uh, the appropriate null space. And let's look at the singular values. We start, we go down the diagonal, down one over one, down one over one, and boom, we run out of room. But now we're limited by rows. And so there are some extra things tacked on to the end over here. Those are the things that we had to tack on. Um, when we went from u sub r, or sigma sub r, to sigma for this case. But the important thing is, down the diagonal, all positive numbers. That tells us full rank. And let's look at a deficient rank case. Now here, um, I forget what I did, 6, 6. Um, I, I changed something. What did I change? Six three seven zero six. Uh, oh, um, I changed the middle row, um, so I made the middle row equal to the first row. Is what I did here. So a little bit different than what I had done in the past. Um, and when I when we look at this, um, and I, I called this matrix A A. I don't know why I called it A A. Did I do that in every one? No, I didn't. Um, all right. So this matrix is A A. Um, and I do the decomposition. I still have the same sizes, 3 by 3, 5 by 5, and 3 by 5. But now look at the key thing here. Um, I still have a bunch of zeros out here, but I also have an entire row of zeros at the bottom. But one of those is important. That is part of our singular value down the diagonal. Um, so in this case, we would say we have three singular values, one of which is zero and two of which are non-zero. So that would tell us rank two. So you can see how key the singular value decomposition is, even just to figuring out what the rank is. In fact, I think the rank command may actually compute the rank um, just by finding the, the singular value decomposition of the matrix A. I have to check that, but I'm pretty sure that's true. So up to this point, we've been wishing, we've been hoping. I've been telling you this all works, but we've not seen why this is possible. So here's a simple kind of quote unquote proof of the singular value decomposition. It's not totally rigorous, but it's pretty good. 
A mathematician might take a little bit of exception to this, but it, it, I like it better than some of the other proofs because it does kind of point out the connection between singular value decomposition and eigenvalue decomposition on something else. So let's take our A matrix, could potentially be rectangular. We've already seen that it could be square, and we can work with a square matrix um, just fine, even one that's not symmetric. We work with it just fine. So any matrix, A. Um, and we're going to look at the two matrices, A transpose A and A, A transpose. Now each of those is square and each of those is symmetric. So that's the key right there. We know how to do eigenvalues for these things. They're symmetric and they're at least positive semi-definite. So uh, we don't know whether A has all of its columns independent. It might, it might not. Um, and so if, if, it, um, if it doesn't, it'll at least be positive semi-definite. If it does have all of its columns independent, then it will be positive definite. So um, even just for the positive semi-definite case, the fact that it's symmetric um, tells us that we've got a nice eigen decomposition of each of these. And it's nice because the eigenvalues are non-negative. That's nice. Maybe zero, but at least not negative. And the eigenvectors are orthonormal. And they form a basis for um, some space. So here's our claim. Our claim is that in terms of the v's and sigmas and u's that we've been talking about, that we can write a transpose a this way, um, and that those matrices will be the, um, the v and the sigma matrix for the singular value decomposition of a itself. And we also claim that a a transpose can be decomposed this way. Now those look awfully like eigenvalue decompositions, right? We see that we have V and V transpose. That's the Q and the Q transpose that we were talking about. We see a matrix in the middle. Now, sigma for our singular value decomposition is some form of, of, um, of triangle or uh, diagonal matrix. And actually, technically, I I think I've made a little bit of a mistake here. I think I should have sigma times sigma transpose, um, technically. Um, I think I might go and change that. Um, so this really should be sigma times sigma transpose um, in, in the middle there. I'll, I'll, I'll have to check this um, because sigma uh, is the same size as A. Um, so maybe I have to have sigma transpose sigma. Uh, I'll fix it. I'll fix it. I'll fix it. Um, and same kind of thing over here. <coughs> So, um, so a little funkiness here on, on the video, but I'll fix it in the notes, so the notes will be correct. Um, so this is telling us that um, if, if this claim is true, to find the singular value decomposition of A, we just have to find uh, a, form A transpose A and then do an eigenvalue decomposition of it, and form A A transpose, do, we do an eigenvalue decomposition of that, and we'll have all three matrices that we need. We'll have V, we'll have sigma, and we'll have U. So let's take a look at this. Here's our proof. So A transpose A is at least positive semi-definite. So I can decompose it this way, V times lambda V transpose. That was our classic way of doing the eigenvalue decomposition. And since it's positive semi-definite, this is going to be square and diagonal, and the things down the diagonal will be, um, some of them will be positive, and maybe some of them will be zero, since it's positive semi-definite. So the elements in lambda are non-negative. The columns of V are orthonormal. So let's form, uh, yeah, see, I got it right here. <laughs> I did it correctly here, and then I didn't go back and fix it the previous page. Let's form the diagonal matrix sigma, where we're just going to go and look at lambda and 
if uh, we'll put the the values, the eigenvalues in lambda, let's just put them in descending order. Um, so all the non-zero ones, positive ones, will be up in the upper left part. And we can just take square roots of those and split them um, and, and put the square roots of those non-zero ones down the diagonal of sigma. And then once we run out of ones that we can do square roots of, um, the, the zero ones, well, I mean, technically, I guess <laughs> I didn't have to get so, so funky here. Um, I can take the square root of zero just fine. I don't know why I was thinking I couldn't do that. Um, so basically, I'm just going to go down the diagonal of lambda, take the square roots of that. If they're positive numbers, I'm going to stick them in. If they're zero, I'm going to stick them in. So I'm going to run them down the diagonal of sigma, but I'm going to make sigma the right size, um, same size as a. So as we saw earlier, I may go down the diagonal and hit a vertical bound, or I may come down the diagonal and hit a horizontal bound, um, but either way, it's fine. So once I do that, I now have a rectangular matrix sigma um, such that down the diagonal are um, a bunch of positive numbers followed by some number of zeros down the diagonal. And if I form sigma transpose sigma, I end up getting um, uh, my lambda matrix up there. Now we can write this this way. Um, so A transpose A got expanded this way, and I'm now going to, let me clear this off here, I, I'm now going to substitute in for lambda this quantity here. So there it is there, and now I'm just going to group things together. So, um, well, I'm, I'm not going to group things together yet. I'm going to deal with the U matrix. So now uh, let's put into the U matrix the ortho orthonormal eigenvectors for the other one, A, A transpose. Um, and since they are orthonormal eigenvectors and U will be square, um, I will have U transpose U is equal to the identity matrix. And so if I could put an identity matrix in here in between the sigmas, well, I could also put this in there instead. So putting an identity matrix in there does nothing, so putting U transpose U in there does nothing. Now I'm going to group things together. So what I now have is that A transpose A gives me this decomposition. But look at this. This I can identify as A, and this I can identify as A transpose. And this is our singular value decomposition. And so what we've just done is proved that to find the u, the v, and the sigma, all we got to do is eigenvalue decomposition on A transpose A to get v and, and sigma, and then do an eigenvalue decomposition on A, A transpose. We can get sigma again if we want it, but we don't have to. Um, we're just getting the U matrix from that. And that gives us our um, wishful thinking uh, has, has paid off. Exactly what we wished for, we've shown we can get. And that's beautiful. Now let's do some numerical examples. Uh, we've already seen some here with MATLAB, but these are things that we can do by hand um, to find the singular values and singular vectors. So these are more like what you would see on a homework or on an exam. So here's a, a, a matrix, 4, 4, negative 3, negative 3. Certainly not, um, well, it's square, so we could find eigenvalues and eigenvectors, but not nice ones. But we form A transpose A. Uh, we get this thing and look at that. That's um, square and symmetric. And we can, I, I don't show the steps, but you can do the steps that we use to find the eigenvalues and eigenvectors, and we find those. Um, therefore, our sigma value, our, our sigma matrix is diagonal, so there should be a zero up here and a zero here. And we take the square roots of our eigenvalues and, and put them in here. And then the V just comes from uh, these vectors go in as our our v. Then we take and do the eigenvalue decomposition for this. 
Yeah, big deal. We got the same eigenvalues, so we didn't really need to find those. What's important is finding the eigenvectors of this, and those will be the columns of U. So there's our U matrix. In this case, it's the identity matrix. So there's a simple example finding the singular value decomposition for a simple 2 by 2 matrix. And so let's continue on with this. So here's our, our uh, matrix A. We've found the V matrix. We've found the sigma matrix. And we've found the U matrix. So we can write this out as a decomposition. So here's our A matrix is equal to U times sigma, remember there's a zero here and a zero here, times V. And if you were to work that all out, you would find that it is actually equal to each other. And so, here is a matrix that could not be diagonalized by eigenvalue decomposition, being nicely and easily diagonalized by the singular value decomposition. So, if diagonalization is something that's important, and it is, Singular value decomposition, decomposition is a much more general way of finding this decomposition. So here's another example. Now we have a rank 1 matrix. You can check that um, either with MATLAB or you can just kind of look to see. Um, 8 is 2 times 4. 6 is 2 times 3. So the, the bottom row is just twice the, the top row. So A is a singular matrix because it's rank 1. Full rank would be rank 2. Um, and so here's the picture that we have in our head of our spaces. Um, the row space will be spanned by um, this vector. Could be We could pick the other one um, if we want. The null space will be perpendicular to that, so we just draw it there for now. The column space, we can pick this as our column for that. We could just as easily have picked this one. Um, they will lie on the same line. Um, and, and the number C here and the number D here is just showing that we, we take all scalar multiples of, of this um, sing, single vector. And we know that the null space of A transpose will be orthogonal to that. Um, so we haven't yet figured out what these two null spaces are. So let's take a look at that. So I've just repeated those pictures here. Um, so we know the dimension of the row space is, for this case, well, what is it? It's R. The dimension of the row space is R. The rank of A. Rank of A was 1. So we have a one-dimensional row space which is spanned by this um, single vector. Basis of the one-dimensional row space is 4, 3. We can choose the orthogonal basis of the row space and the column space to look like this. Um, so we just have our, our 4 and 3 that comes from up here, and we're just normalizing by 5 so that we get orthonormal. And then we take... Um, uh, the, the other one, 4 and 8, could just as easily be replaced by 1 and 2. Uh, and then we normalize it by square root of 5 to get a, a unit vector. So we've got those. So we're continuing on with the same example. Um, I don't know why I said another example here. It's the same example. Um, continuing on. So what is... Um, what goes in um, there? So we already know that one of these singular values is going to be 0 because it's rank 1. So 2 by 2 is rank 1. So it's only going to have one non-zero singular value. So we need to find what that is. So how do we find that? Well, the easy way, A transpose A gives us this nice symmetric matrix, and we find the eigenvalues of that eigenvalues, one of them will be 0, one of them will be non-zero, uh, and we take the square root of each of those. Square root of 0 is 0. Sorry about my dog barking in the background there. I have no idea what's bothering her. Uh, but our other one, lambda 2, we're going to take the square root of that. 
Um, and so there is our, our final result. Um, and uh, so that's how we find singular value decomposition. We, we found the U and the V in the previous part of this example. We see we have one non-zero one because it's a two by two with rank one. Therefore, we're going to have to have one zero valued singular value. Um, well, uh, I just said we found U and V. Actually, we, we haven't. We found only one uh, column of each. What are the other columns of this? Remember, those span um, the null space. So we need that thing to span this null space, which is orthogonal to this vector. So it's a one-dimensional space orthogonal to this. <clears throat> so we can pick anything that's orthogonal to that and then normalize it. Same thing over here. What goes there? It's going to be in this null space, which we know is going to be orthogonal to this. So it can be anything that's orthogonal to 4, 3, and then we normalize it. So if we just pick negative 2, 1 here, um, you can verify that that, doesn't, that is indeed orthogonal to that. And the reason that we picked that particular one is that it has the same normalization as the first columns. So it makes it a little easier to write it. And then over here, um, we can pick, we had the 0 0.8, 0 0.6 that we got before, and um, we're just going to pick uh, this as something that is orthogonal to that column. You can check with inner products by hand to show that those things are orthogonal to each other. And so there's our complete singular value decomposition of this. So let's summarize what we've seen from the four space, subspaces viewpoint. Um, the V1 through VR form an orthonormal basis of the row space. U1 through UR form an orthonormal basis of the column space. We tacked on a bunch of vectors <clears throat> that are orthogonal to each other and are an orthonormal basis of the null space. Therefore, they will automatically be orthogonal to all of these. Um, so these two things together form a complete orthonormal basis for Rn. And then we tack on some more um, in the other side uh, to, to give a basis, orthonormal basis of the left null space. So these bases diagonalize the matrix. We've seen how that works. They go into the U and the V matrix and, and show up like that. And here's the idea. Um, we start with um, our vectors v1 and v2 of unit length. They are normalized. So those are the two singular vectors. Uh, and we think about applying um, v transpose to those. Remember that creates the um, identity matrix. So um, these things put in as columns times v transpose will give us a 1, 0, 0, 1. And, and this is not complex numbers. These are the fundamental um, or standard orthonormal vectors. Then we apply our sigma matrix. So we're, we're just walking our way through this. Then we apply our sigma matrix. And it takes this nice circle here that's aligned with the axes and changes based upon the values of the sing singular values. Um, so it makes them smaller or bigger. And then um, the U matrix rotates things back off away from the standard axes into something like this. Um, and we see that ellipses show up again. So uh, we haven't dwelled on it, but the ellipse is kind of king in all of these um, discussions. It's always underlying things there. So uh, we'll finish this note set off with um, just a little bit of discussion of what is this thing good for? Well, we've, I've hopefully already convinced you that eigen decompositions are extremely important. We saw an example of that, and I've been harping on it, telling you it's good, it's good, it's good. It's used all over the place. Um, well, the singular value decomposition is also good. Um, it's used for tons of things. 
Um, and it's more general because uh, we, we don't have to have a nice symmetric or positive definite matrix to make things work well. Um, so we can apply it in scenarios where, um, where we don't have that nice structure. Um, and I can tell you there are things built into um, algorithms that are used in cell phone uh, infrastructure. I, I, I can tell you they, the singular value decomposition is in there. Um, it may not be obvious, but it, 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 it's in there. Uh, the reality is, is that um, the singular value decomposition probably leads to the solution for some of those um, algorithms, but you might not have to actually explicitly do it in those algorithms, but it, it's in there. So like I said, shows up in lots of places. Um, one thing we haven't talked about is that it's, it's good for dealing with matrices that are almost rank deficient. So if we're trying to work with those things and do things with them, uh, like least squares and, and other algorithms, uh, the fact that they're close to being um, singular matrices can cause some problems numerically. And so the singular value decomposition has been shown to be uh, a, a, an indispensable tool when trying to work with these things. Um, and kind of along those lines, it's great for solving least squares problems. Now we didn't talk about, um, and we've already talked about the least squares solution and we haven't seen how we would use the singular value decomposition for that. Um, but in reality, if we're going to be implementing least squares on actual computers, you should probably be using something like the singular value decomposition. Um, either use the SVD or something that does something similar to combat some of the effects of numerical roundoff. So there's actually a, a, a book called Numerical Recipes that has an entire chapter on least squares. And basically they get to the point where they say, listen, if you're writing code to do least squares, you ought to be using the singular value decomposition to do it. Um, so I've done lots of um, projects where we've had to solve least squares problems. Um, you know, kind of in real time, the computer has to collect data and do that computation. It's not like there's somebody sitting there assessing what's going on. And um, I've worked out the, the, the results in MATLAB. Things worked really well. And then I had to work with the software engineers to, to get this thing to work. And if we didn't use the singular value decomposition, the algorithm just simply would not work. Um, but with the singular value decomposition, it worked beautifully. No numerical round off issues at all. Um, and we've, we, because of this link between eigenvalues and singular values, we already saw that if we have a matrix R, uh, we didn't call it R, um, but we some t in this set of notes. But if we have some matrix R um, that could be rectangular, and we form a square matrix that's going to be symmetric, we often solve problems in terms of the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of A. Um, now, the value of the singular value decomposition is that we've just seen that if we can do the singular value decomposition on its own without doing the trick that we said, form this and find the singular vectors, um, then we can operate directly on R. So even though I was telling you by hand, form this matrix and do an eigenvalue analysis to find the singular vectors and singular values, that's not how a computer would do it. And a computer can actually find the singular value decomposition directly in terms of R without actually forming this. So first of all, it saves us all this computation. So if R is a big matrix, we don't have to actually form that. We can just work directly with R. So we've already seen one scenario where this is true. So that acoustic focusing problem that we looked at in the previous set of notes we had our big H matrix, and I said, oh, let's form H transpose H, find the eigenvalues and vectors for that, the eigenvector corresponding to the largest eigenvalue of H transpose H was the solution we were looking for. But now, 
if our computer can work directly with R without ever, well, in H in this case, can work directly with H without having to compute H transpose H. And remember, H transpose, well, H was a big matrix, so doing that was a lot of work. Then we got to find eigenvalues of that thing. Um, so we can work directly with the H matrix, which in many applications is absolutely crucial. And et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, to steal a line from the king and I. Um, <laughs> I can't tell you how often these things pop up in the more advanced ECE applications. Um, so hopefully um, this has gotten you excited about singular value decomposition. And uh, so I, I believe this is our last bit in Chapter 6, and next we'll be moving on to... Um, uh, another chapter whose number I can't remember off the top of my head right now. Um, but when you tune into the next note set, it'll tell you which chapter we're going to be in. So we'll see you there.